In Galatians 2 and verse 20, as in the song that we just sang, based upon this passage, we're going to be talking about dying to Christ, about dying to ourself and Christ then living in us. And if you'll turn over the, the 24th chapter of Luke, Luke 24 and verse 25, Jesus, in going back to the earliest of history, is explaining to them, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures concerning himself. And that's one of the most fascinating studies is the bloodline of Jesus Christ going back to Genesis Garden until the time of Jesus on the cross and then comes a gap between there and my heart. And so let me ask you uh, in, in a, a bit of a prelude here, what? why is it that we need, why do we require a Savior? In the 8th Psalm, the Psalm of uh, 8th Psalm and verse 4, Who is man that you are mindful of him, said David. And so we should indeed humble ourselves before a Savior, a creator of all things, that spoke the earth and the universe into existence. Another fine study there. And if you will then turn over to Ephesians, the first chapter. We're going to keep a pretty lively pace going in the study. Uh, and, and so uh, I would ask that you please flip quickly in, in trying to keep up. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Drop down to verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that to come. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is all comprehensive. And so when we speak about Jesus filling us, the only question comes is that how selfish am I in retaining the things of the old world, the old life? In Ephesians, the second chapter, in verse 6, probably the same opening, He raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse chapter 3 and verse 10 of Ephesians, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we can look back to the time of Genesis when sin first came into the world and then look toward Calvary when sin came out of the world by His death on the cross. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And he goes on to talk about the, the, uh, the armor of God that is in our, our defenses. In 2 Kings 6 and verse 19, you see, we live in a parallel universe. I see dead people. That's the way we should be looking at things around us. Because that surely is the case. Looking around us and seeing all of the dead people that we are walking and living with, but you and I are the reality, the reality, the eternal reality is that of serving Jesus Christ. And an eternal life that you began when you were immersed you began that walk there, and it will never end. 
And so you go back to 2 Kings 6 and you see where, where uh, Elijah would told his servant, go and look around. The servant was saying, it's just me and you against a, uh, the uh, army around us. And Elijah said, no, no, look around you. And God opened his eyes and he saw the heavenly host of angels around him, of which one, one angel of death went through Egypt and slew all of the firstborn. One. We sing the song sometimes. He could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him. That was not the purpose. The purpose was that Jesus would die. Uh, in Mark 9 and verse 43, Mark 9 and verse 43, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And Jesus speaking here about the valley of Gehenna, of Hinnom, where the children of Israel, in Isaiah 66, there was, a, um, there was an idol that was made to Molech, and, and this idol had outstretched hands, and there was a bronze laver that was between his hands, and they would build a fire underneath. It's one of the most horrific details of history. And they would take infants, and they would heat up this brass laver, red hot, and then they would take infants and place them into that. Uh, one of the most, like I said, the, the most horrific thing. And so this valley of Hinnom, it was cursed. It was, it was despised. This was an atrocity to God, and it was an atrocity to mankind. And so it became a trash dump. And every dead thing, this was just south of, of Jerusalem, you go to the Google and you can see it. It's, it's still, uh, it was this trash dump and it was burning constantly and it was maggot infested and it was death. And that's what became symbolic of hell. And the opposite of the symbolism of, of hell, this horrible thing, the opposite of that is then heaven. And so Jesus speaking about this dwelling place where he's going in John, the 14th chapter, in the first verse, John, the Gospel of John 14 and verse 1, <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's why a, a Savior is so important to us. That's why a Savior is so important to us, is because He has invited us to spend eternity with Him in heaven. Now we read uh, earlier in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and we got right up to the, the armor of God speaking about this battle, this battle that we have against the forces of evil. And in Romans 3 and verse 23, we see that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 6 and verse 23, we see that the wages of sin are death. Wages of sin, it's what you earn. You work for death and you earn that unless you receive the gift of Jesus Christ and the cleansing that he has, the cleansing life that he offers us. In the Gospel of John 12 and verse 31, uh, Jerry read in, in a, the class, we won't take the time to reread this, where Jesus' death on the cross that he would draw all people to him. And then if we go over to Isaiah 53, a passage we use in talking about the communion, the, communion, the Lord's Supper, we, we will re routinely read Isaiah 53. In verses 4 through 6, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we're healed. And by we like sheep have gone astray. We look to these things and we, we uh, look at the wording in Acts 2 and verse 41. Look at the wording here. If you will, if you have your, your Bibles, turn over to Acts 2 and verse 41. 
We're almost finished with the introduction here. 2 and verse 41. Then those who gladly received His Word were baptized that day. About 3,000 souls were added to them. See, the Lord adds you to His church. When you are obedient in baptism, then God adds you to His church. A lot of people don't have a problem with that, but they have a problem with adding God, adding God to themselves. We're reluctant to let go of ourselves. We're power hungry and we want to hold on to what we are. What about me? And so when we read uh, in the, the reading this morning in Romans 6 and verse 3 through 6, when we are baptized into Christ, what do we do? We put on Christ. We clothe ourselves with Him. In the... Uh, Gospel of John 1 and verse 1. Gospel of John 1 and verse 1. An interesting set of uh, words is used here in the Gospel of John. I really like the first chapter so much. Makes things so clear. 1-1. One, one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And the same thing is going on today. The darkness still does not comprehend Jesus Christ. And from, uh, as I talked about earlier in, uh, in Genesis 3, when it is foretold that the seed of, of, of God would come and it would crush Satan's head, the, indicating the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that would defeat devil, that would defeat uh, Satan and God's rule over death. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in 1 John. John has such an interesting way of, of expressing things, and he, he says so much what I want to express to you about how we fill ourselves with Jesus Christ. John 1, and we're going to read the entire first chapter. That which was from the beginning. You see how this keeps coming up? The same reoccurring phrase that talks about from the beginning. Because see, that was God's eternal purpose. When sin came into the world, God set forth a plan to take sin back out of the world. That which was from the beginning, which we have, ser which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Remember reading back in John 1.1? 1, 1? The Word became flesh and dwelt among men. Here's this Word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things I write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And His Word is not in us. His Word is not in us. Now I have a, an analogy that I want to use to express this. Uh, a, a farm pond. A farm pond known in Texas as tanks. It's an earthen vessel that is dredged out of the ground and it collects water. And sometimes it, it's really, really basic. And sometimes they're very beautiful. But if you walk up to even the prettiest of them and you look into that farm pond or that tank, what do you see? 
You see bugs and mud and algae. You see trash. If there are cattle, there's manure. All of this is in this farm pond. So from a distance, it looks pretty. You get up close, there's no way you'd want to drink from that. There's no way you'd want to swim in that. Nobody even wants to paddle a boat across that. And the analogy is that when you and I become a child of God and we make what the world sees, God has asked us to dredge out all of the trash that is in that. And an interesting thing happens when you dredge out all of that trash, all of that muck, all of that algae, all of that manure. An interesting thing happens. We have a greater capacity for volume. For volume. And this greater capacity and this cleanliness, once that is all cleansed out, and then someone looking into us, looking into us, then sees the purity of the life-giving water living in us. Then sees not just something attractive from a distance, but up close and pure as God intended it. Now I want to draw back on this analogy as we go on. And I want you to think about this capacity for greater volume for God. A greater love, a greater depth, a greater purity. Because this is going to be the challenge that I'm going to be leaving you with here in just a few minutes. John, 1 John 1, I'm sorry, 1 John 2 and verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. A lot of people don't have a problem in having Jesus as a Savior. They've got a problem with having Jesus as their Lord. They don't want to follow everything he says. They don't want to let their words be his words. Even amongst the church, I have discovered an interesting thing. Try this sometime. Somebody asks you a question, philosophical, social, whatever the question is, try to answer them with the scripture. And they'll, and they'll uh, okay, appreciate that. You know, they'll, they'll thank you for that. And then give them another scripture, and then the true test, give them a third scripture. And I have had Christians correct me and say, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for a Bible passage. And you see, that's the problem. We're not looking for a Bible passage, a Bible answer. We're not looking for a thus saith the Lord. For the answers to the questions in our lives. 1 John 2 and verse 15 <clears throat> Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father but is of the world, and the world is passing away, and the lust of it. He who does the will of God abides forever. See, that's what I was talking about earlier. It started at the time in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. It starts when you are immersed and have your sins washed away. But it never ends. For all eternity, we are supposed to be, he has asked us to be children of God. John, 1 John 3 and verse 1. 1 John 3, hold on. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when, we, when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. 
and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Remember that farm pond. To purify ourselves, to muck it out. That's the term that farmers use when they're going to clean out the barn. Somebody asks you sometime, hey, can you come help me muck something out? That's what they're talking about. They want you to help them to get rid of all the gunk. It's not an attractive job, but it's a very important job. And it's what I'm asking you today. I'm asking you to muck out your hearts, to muck out your minds, to muck out your mouth. We had a phrase when I, was, when I was young and somebody would say something ugly and we'd say, you kiss your mama with that mouth? Because you shouldn't be talking like that. And oh my word, has the world diminished since that point. <clears throat> First John 3 and verse 7. Little children... Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he has been born of God. And we talk about we've been born, raised, the old man has died, and we are now born of Jesus Christ and we've put on Christ, as we read earlier in the reading this morning back in Romans 3 and uh, 6 through 3 through 6. Here in the same opening, 1 John 4, 1 John 4 and verse 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How do you know that someone is a false teacher? They teach something that's false. It, it, it kind of goes hand in hand. You say, well, that's kind of a duh, Nick. Yeah, it is. How do you know that someone is teaching error? How do you know that this error-teaching person is not righteous? It's because the Bible says so. For in verse 9, <clears throat> In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. To live through Him. Verse 12, 412. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior <coughs> of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. And that's what I'm talking about with this greater capacity. to, If we dredge out everything that's not godliness in our lives, dredge out, muck out all of that from our lives, we have a greater capacity to fill ourselves with him. And that way, when we open our mouths to speak to someone, what's going to come out? Nothing profane, because there's nothing profane in us. We've purged that out. We've removed that from our lives, from our vocabulary, from our thoughts. You got a wicked mouth? 
you got to first change your thinking. You got to stop thinking those words, those thoughts. Now you say, well, Nick, that's easier said than done. Oh, we got a scripture for that. I'm getting ahead of myself. 1 John 5 and verse 11. 1 John 5 and verse 11. <clears throat> This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the, have the Son of God does not have life. Verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in my name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come, and has given us an understanding, that we may know Him who is true, that we are in Him who is true, that in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is true God, this is the true God, the eternal life. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. 1 Peter 4.11 If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things... How many things are we not talking about? I'm not talking about any other thing. In all things. That all is an all-consuming thing. In all things... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, we speak Christ, and everything else is rubbish. Everything else is garbage. Everything else that's not Christ is useless. Now, there's probably a few times Wendy's drive up. That may be a time when you might speak something else. Because they're going to want to take your order. And there's going to be a buildup behind you in other cars if you don't speak your order. So there are times, I recognize, when other words are necessary. But certainly those words, those extraneous words, looking at your wife and saying, I love you, darling. Those are important words. And those things still glorify God. Galatians 1 and verse 6. <clears throat> Galatians 1 and verse 6. Hmm, that's interesting. You have no clock in here. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Good, good job, Jerry. Galatians 1 and verse 6, you, you, the old joke, you know what it means when a preacher looks at a clock, nothing. Galatians 6, uh, Galatians 1 and verse 6 through 12. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ Jesus to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel than, uh, to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? Or if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 20, no prophecy of Scripture is of private interpretation. We go to the Scriptures. Well, I've, and I've had people argue with me. Um, I'll, I'll read a passage and they'll say, that's your interpretation. I didn't interpret it. All I did was read it. And they say, well, that's your interpretation. I don't have an interpretation. I don't know anything except I read it in God's Word. Galatians 4 and verse 12. <clears throat> Galatians 4, 12. 
Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not in not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you have received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. When What, when, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear witness that you, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given to them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I'm perplexed by this. These people used to, the Galatians used to love the apostle so much that they would have taken out their eyes and given to him. They would have given him anything. And yet we read back earlier at the first chapter, have you so soon, night and day for three years, verse 18, what saith, uh, I'm perplexed, uh, Galatians 4 and, and verse 18, it's good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to present you now with my change in my tone, for I have doubts about you. Have you ever proclaimed God's truth to somebody and you come back later? And that's not the same person. This, this person is, is not a godly person at all anymore. I, I'm perplexed by this. Uh, verse 30 of Galatians 4. Galatians 4.30. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? I don't, what Nick says is of no consequence. What Nick says and a quarter won't get you a cup of coffee. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall be the heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondservant, but of the free. What saith the Scriptures? There are churches that don't call this a worship assembly anymore. A subtle shift. Well, this is not a worship assembly. And once you break down that Scripture, once you no longer... Follow the scripture that says, gather and worship God. Once you break that down, well then, oh, this is not a worship service. So we can do anything we choose to. We can, well, we can. Why, why should we sing? Why should we pray? Why should we proclaim God's word? Why should we break the bread? 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 11, 18. When you come together in the church, the progressives are a wildfire in the brotherhood. But it all starts with me. Have I filled me with Jesus Christ? Or have I filled me with worldliness? Have I filled me with new age ideas and philosophies of men? Drudge, dredge out that muck. We read Galatians 4, 16. Am I, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? A good passage to lay to memory. Especially in this day and age where someone asks you about some social more or some change and, and you tell them what the scriptures say and they get all upset. I, I posted a picture that I was straight proud. I was proud of my wife and I, and I took so much heat saying that how dare you say that? That you're proud to be married to a woman? How dare you say that? 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. 2 Peter 2, 1. The, the scriptures abound with so much. Let's, let's do a thus saith the Lord. What do the scriptures say? Let's use the definitions that the scriptures give to us. 2 and verse 1. There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. And that's certainly the world we live in. 
It's not new. It's as old as sin. Verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Nick, what a preachy thing to say. I can't say it any way else. I don't have the authority to say these things any other way. I don't have the authority to accept or to dismiss anyone's lifestyle or anyone's actions. We all answer to our Savior. Acts the 20th chapter and the 28th verse. Acts 20 and verse 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock which God made the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And yet we go to Galatians 1 and we see that I don't even know you people anymore. You've gone to a different gospel, which is not another gospel, but it's a perverse thing that you're following after. And though we or an angel from heaven teach anything contrary to what the Bible teaches, let them be accursed. What a preachy man Peter was. And I must follow in his footsteps. But let me ask you this. Who's the greater fool? The snake oil salesman? or the person that believes the snake oil salesman. <clears throat> snake oil salesman comes in and tells you all about the grand thing that the, he has to offer you, and you need to go to the scriptures like the Bereans and prove the things that were said according to God's word. Jeremiah 5.31, a wonderful, horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. The people love to have it so. Well, this, hasn't anything changed in the world? The people love to have it unrighteous. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. Demas hath loved this present world. We sing that song sometimes. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days. And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. We like it here. But that's not what God asked of us. He asked us to dredge out the muck from our lives. To dredge out the muck and sin and filth. It's a hard thing, isn't it? We're, we're told to go out into the world, yet to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And that is a challenge. You work with somebody with a foul mouth, and it starts to have an influence on you. Rather than have that foul-mouthed employee turn to you after a tirade and say, Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry I offended you. I'm sorry, I know you're a principled individual. I know I offended you, and I apologize. That's 
the example, that's the influence that we should have on the world. <clears throat> Ephesians 2 and verse 11. We're going to sing a song in a little while. Without him, I would be nothing. In Ephesians, the second chapter and the 11th verse. <clears throat> Losing my voice. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hand, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you cleansed? Luke 2 and verse 11. For to you this day a child is born. To you this day in the city of David. Christ the Lord has come. That good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's supposed to fill us. To fill us. Colossians 2 and verse 10. We're almost finished. You've been a very kind, attentive audience. I, I am very grateful for that. Colossians, the second chapter and the tenth verse. <clears throat> for you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Galatians 3 and verse 19. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. He just got done telling them earlier, you, you, were, you were Gentiles, you were strangers, you were foreigners. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. This vessel, remember my analogy of, of the tank, it's a built-in vessel, and you and I are a built vessel for Him to be filled with Him, with His love, with His concern, with His dedication to the Word of God. The fullness to have a greater volume because we've dredged out these things. Go back to Ezekiel. An interesting passage that is used back here. It expresses, uh, uh, it expresses an idea that I, I, I want to use here toward the end in my conclusion. Ezekiel, the 36th chapter in the 25th verse. Remember the farm pond. Then I will sprinkle, sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Verse 31, Then you will remember your evil ways, and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. And that's the slime that God has asked you to get rid of. Go over to Philippians. We're going to close out with a couple of passages in Philippians. And then the lesson is yours. Philippians 1 and verse 21. <clears throat> For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Drop down chapter 4. Verse 8. You know, I, I read this passage 
I'm sorry, keep it just a little bit long. I read this passage about meditating on these things. And I, and I had to start meditating about what does it mean to meditate. And so, I want you, here's your homework assignment for this week. Jerry, you get back with me. Let me know how they're doing. Your homework assignment for this week. I want you to remember this passage. And you'll have a little downtime. You're sitting there behind the wheel, or or you're uh, you're commuting, or you're you're waking up in the morning. Your alarm clock goes off. Oh, I don't want to get out of bed. And you you start to think about all the things you need to do today. You start to think about all of these things, these useless things I've been telling you. And I want you to remember this passage. And I want you to say, you know, that's a useless thing. I was just thinking about something else that needs doing. And that was a useless thing. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to think about chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And I want you, your homework assignment, should you accept it, is to purge out the muck and the trash out of your life. And to meditate on these things. Now, you say to, you say to me, you'll come back a, a week from now and you'll say, well, Nick, I, I, I look at this list and I, I still, I'm still not real sure what I'm supposed to be thinking of. Have you ever caught yourself thinking about something and you say, oh, I ought not to be thinking about that. Bingo! That's what I'm talking about. I ought not to be thinking about that. I ought to think about something lovely, something lovely, something lovely. Well, I can think about my darling wife. I can think about, oh, the knockoff roses are coming into bloom right now. What a beautiful thing God has placed. Isn't that a lovely thing? A child of God was saved last week. A young person dedicated their life to the Lord. You know, I should, I should go to them and encourage them. They may need some encouragement. You know, I remember when I was a child of God and I was first a Christian. And I remember that I got a little bit discouraged right after that. You know, I should go to them. Maybe I should send them a letter. I need to send my mom a letter. You see how this works? You start to think about something lovely, something pure, something just, something virtuous. And all of a sudden, you are filled with godliness. And you're dredging out all this muck by the shovelful, and you're filling it with Christ. How much trash do you have in your lives? you got the answer to that. And so I ask that if you have not become a child of God, and I always tell people, somebody will say to me, am I ready to be a child of God? And I always say, when you can't sleep. That's when it's time. When you can't sleep. My life is bothering me so much, I can't do one more thing before I make my life right with the Lord. Before I, I believe in God, sure, uh, but I, oh, I've got sin. You don't know me, Nick. Yeah, but Jesus Christ knows you. God knows your heart. Isn't that actually a wondrous thing? You don't have to explain something. I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And with that confession and the repentance, I'm not going to do that anymore. Remember the, week, the week's homework. Add to your faith virtue. Think on these things. Meditate on these things. <coughs> Repent of those things and start to do godly things and fill yourself with, have a greater capacity because you've now cleansed yourself of the, uh, of the how did he say back in, in, uh, in Ezekiel, of the abominations of the iniquities, the horrible things that fill people's lives and hearts, then you're ready to become a child of God. Well, maybe you've become a child of God, but you know, you've got really big things lacking in your life. 
you've got problems. You can't hardly think about godly things. There's too many other things that are packed into this. It's time to dredge out all of that trash. And if we can be helpful in any way, won't you come now as we stand and we sing them?